Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. The readings for the 13th Sunday after Pentecost for September 4th, 2022 are as follows. The first reading is Deuteronomy 30, verses 15 through 20. The alternative first reading would be Jeremiah 18, verses 1 through 11. Our psalm is the first psalm. The second reading is from from Philemon 1 through 21. Uh, And uh, our gospel is Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 33. Okay, I have to ask you a question. Like, okay, so when we do the intro, you know, welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me. Uh, Do you find yourself doing kind of like the Brady Bunch? Like when you introduce yourself, you look at the square? Yep. Okay. <laughs> it's like it won't go on if I don't look at it, right? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we still are on YouTube. People who only listen to us, you know, you can yeah. You can you can treat this like a you can like when you're watching Netflix between shows, you can just slip over and, and watch us on YouTube. Exactly. It's hilarious. Yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> Ah, yeah, I just find myself looking down. Oh, yeah, I'm asking. Anyway, <laughs> all right, Luke, we have skipped, we should note, the parable of the great dinner. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we were talking about the, uh, the text of uh, who will you sit with and where will you sit. Um, and so we've skipped also that as well, but now move into this, um, move into this last portion of 14 uh, that, but I just wanted to make a note of that. I don't know why I think it's important. <laughs> no, but context no, it matters. What? Context matters. Context, context matters. does matter. It does matter. And we've, been talking, would, and we've been talking about knowing where you're going. And so it, it's appropriate uh, to just remind our listeners that, you know, uh, a few weeks back as we knew we were making this move, we noted, yeah. where are you going and have an idea of that direction? Um, so, but it's, but it, yeah, and I think, the, I, well, I think the main reason I introduce it is in verse 18, but they all alike begin to make excuses <laughs> and that, and that, and not not that your family is an excuse for not following Jesus or, you know, but, but there's this larger, larger question of, of how is it that, uh, what, what is holding you back from following uh, Jesus? What are, whatever those parameters are. uh, And, and a lot of them are very acceptable parameters, whether they be uh, social, you know, hospitality gatherings to family structures. Uh, so there, it, it, it's not that these are uh, that these are going to be again easy to mm-hmm. leave behind or to to question uh, because they're so embedded, right? Our family structures, our social structures are so embedded in how we go about the in and how we go about the world, and really how we make sense of the world. And so, uh, and so that's. That's the, I, the that's the framework that I'm bringing into uh, thinking about this last section of chapter 14. What is Jesus referring back to mm-hmm. to make these statements? Yeah, mm-hmm. and um, I I don't know. I think I've heard a lot of sermons uh, about counting the cost, um, and and so it 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 strikes me again in terms of making sure the next generation of uh, followers uh, of Christ know that this isn't an easy task. This isn't an, an easy journey. And um, they, there, there will be some, some cost to it. There will be some, some things that you're going to have to uh, let go of. Um, that's a powerful word at the end of this text. To, uh, uh, to become Jesus' disciples, you have to give up all your possessions. You know, we love reading that question of the rich young ruler who went away, you know, um, you know, shaking his head because he was supposed to sell everything that he had. But that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. And um, what is it that is, as you said, Caroline, that is standing in the way of giving your all 
to bearing witness to the God made known in Jesus and what that will look like as a countercultural stance, even in the 21st century, or maybe I should say, especially in the 21st century. It, it hasn't gotten easier for us. Mm -mm. And not only possessions, but I think what this text points out, which I think a lot of listeners would resonate with, is relationships. Yeah. What relationships have changed? What relationships do you have to give up um, or let go mm -hmm. uh, because of your allegiance to the God you know and sure. the God in whom you believe? And and that's that's true. That is just exactly what, what happens. And one, of the, happening. one of the gifts I had when I was young, um, and I'm now old enough where I can say this without it being a lament, um, is that the person that I gave my heart to, the person that I really wanted to marry, um, did not share my faith. And um, we have remained friends all of these years. But uh, I remember after I got over the um, uh, got to the recognition that, oh, OK, this is not going to end in some reunion that we're going to wind up married. Um, I asked him, I said, why? Why didn't we make it? And uh, he said to me something that if he had made me make the choice when I was young, I would have made the wrong choice. Mm -hmm. But he who is not a believer said to me, you believe in God. That's who you are. And I can never believe like that. Mm -hmm. And in hindsight, I realized if he had asked me to make that choice, then I would have chose him in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. I wasn't ready for Luke 14. <laughs> I would have counted the cost and said, sorry, Jesus, too high. <laughs> And yet this person knew me and knew all that I was better than I knew myself. And my words loved me enough to wait and let me live into what God was calling me to be. And uh, I didn't lose the relationship. You know, it's almost like uh, Abraham putting Isaac on the altar. I actually didn't lose the relationship because I'm real sure that if, if he and I had gotten married, we'd be divorced and we wouldn't be friends right now. <laughs> but um, but we have to count the cost. We have to decide, is this message about who God is um, in the midst of a world that is filled with hurts and horrors? a hope that we can still offer because it's hard to offer this hope in this horrific moment. Mm -hmm. It's such a hard passage, partly because it's so clear, you know, that mm -hmm. uh, when he says, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. We're like, well, that must be a riddle, right? That must be. <laughs> um, a riddle. <laughs> Yeah. And then you've got, but you have all of these aphorisms and these little mini parables in here and it can get easy to get lost or, and, but what makes this so hard, I think mostly is he talks about counting the cost, but he doesn't talk in this passage about counting the benefit. Mm -hmm. And you need the wider gospel of Luke for that. We're just mm -hmm. about to hit chapter 15, where you've got the three parables of, of being found and being brought back into community and belonging and so you have to supply some of that because it's, I think it's implicit in this. You need the wider gospel to help you with that because otherwise it just sounds like this is an easy passage to beat up on individuals or to think about that person that you really want to give a stinging sermon toward. And, but this is, so I would encourage us to think about how do you supply that? How do you supply the benefit? But also how do you think about this communally mm -hmm. as well? And so so this is a time where, you know, I think people who listen know it's rare that I say this, but I really want to read this closely in tandem with Deuteronomy 30. <laughs> I'm usually a just give me one text at a time yeah, kind of a, wow. a preacher and teacher. Okay. Deuteronomy 30, again, you have a choice between life and death. There's a lot of yes. either or in today's passages sure. and you get introduced to the two ways, which has got deep roots in the tradition and that's all important, but yeah. Part of what's, and so I'm not just, I'm not, I don't want to exploit the, or I don't want to capitalize on the, on the two ways thing as much as I want to talk about the part of the decision in Deuteronomy 30 is for the sake of your children. It's for the sake of a future generation. It's God says, there's some things in life you can pursue. They're going to kill you. There's some things in life. They're going to bring life to you. 
you get to choose <laughs> and you're going to discover the consequences. But the life stuff isn't about prosperity for you. It seems to be more about community. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. Uh, mm -hmm. And so there's a way in which part of our choices about discipleship are for the sake of the future. Now, I recognize that doesn't stir people to action, especially those of you who are Americans, right? I mean, we we borrow against the future all the time. That's whether it's national debt stuff or climate crisis or some of our foreign policy, right? We are leaving all sorts of burdens. But there are people in the church I know who care deeply about coming generations and are willing to sacrifice for future generations. And to, to think partly about that as we think about cost and benefit, that this is, mm -hmm. our discipleship choices aren't simply about what am I going to give up and what, how, I might, how might I be blessed in return, but it's what kind of world yes. do you wanna live in? Mm -hmm. And that's the deeper question I, I think mm -hmm. that's, that's going on here. I don't wanna merge Deuteronomy 30 and Luke 14 exactly because there's some real different things taking place, mm -hmm. but it is that idea of communal health and a, the idea of a society um, because no one's going to legislate that society into existence. No. Right. Nobody's going to willingly choose it and make it a norm or make it hip. Uh, but the church can continue to embody it in its own really weird way. If, if we decide it's important, not just for us, but for future generations. That's yeah, my really, No, I really appreciate that, Matt. And I, I, I was, putting together the Deuteronomy passage as well. Particularly, I appreciated a paragraph in the commentary, the simple choice is not as easy as it appears. Mm -hmm. It is hard to love God. It is hard to be obedient to God. It is hard to listen to God's voice. Uh, it, therefore, it is hard to make the obvious right choice for life. It's also the case that a choice for death may not be intentional. Mm -hmm. uh, we may not realize that we're obviously choosing death instead of choosing life. And so that, that, that focus on choice, I think, is, a, is really important. And uh, I've been thinking a lot about this in, um, in the last couple of months with the shootings in Buffalo and then um, in Uvalde. And uh, I ran across, uh, ran across this quote uh, of Dietrich Bonhoeffer that, and it goes to your, it goes to your commentary, Matt, about what is this for the sake, for the sake of, for, for future generations. And he has this quote that the test of the morality of a society is what it does for its children. Hmm. And that, that the, you're inviting us into like, what, what, what is the morality, you know, the, of, of our, of, uh, of the church and how we are in the world. And, uh, and, but it's, it's for the sake, like you said, it's for the sake of a future. It's for the sake of um, the ongoingness of, and the constant presence of the kingdom of God and not a fleeting <laughs> moment. Oh. And, and I think that life is also for oneself. Like, I don't want to say mm -hmm. this is all about delayed gratification or sacrifice for another. Yeah, yeah. I, I, the, over the last two years, uh, Michael Chan and I, and Michael Chan used to teach at Luther Seminary, uh, co-taught a course, and we assigned a James Baldwin essay that's kind of the bulk of, of the fire next time, mm -hmm. that book. I think it's called A Letter from a Region in My Mind. I believe it's the name of the essay. It's autobiographical. It talks about how he grew up Christian in Harlem. And, and left the church and how he kind of uh, toyed with the nation of Islam for just a little bit and, and was unconvinced by that. And for both reasons, he thought these two religious institutions were more concerned with power than with love. Mm. And so he, he was seeking a way of love. But one of the things that's astounding about this essay is when he talks about all the racialized injustice in this country, he says, it's actually good for white people to pursue um, racial justice and, and not good for in the sense it's good for you like take your medicine but he's like there are benefits here right he believes that democracy can only work if love is instilled in this and so mm -hmm. what's what's shocking about the essay is not just well shocking I mean what's what's fascinating to me about the essay and why I love reading it with students is it's not just about the problem with the church is it's more interested in power than with, than love which I think is a criticism that's valid in a lot of places but this idea of 
of pursuing justice, pursuing the good life, pursuing things that make for life, however you want to Christianize that out of Baldwin's conception or not, is finally good for everybody. Everybody benefits, everybody flowers. It's not, and so it's, it's getting away from this zero sum thinking that, um, that kills the church and kills our ways of thinking about discipleship. There's got to, if I, if I lose, someone else is going to win in my place or, mm-hmm. um, anyway, that's a long tangent that I'm sorry. I made you all follow me on. No, but. It's right no that, I really appreciated that. And, uh, you let me dance at the beginning. So you, it, it, it was your solo, um, but yours was uh, on target. And, and if you will, um, in some ways it's a setup for the first song. Um, in this sense mm-hmm. of the advice, the way of the wicked, the path of the wicked. Mm-hmm. Um, Baldwin is calling that out, mm-hmm. you know, and, and to recognize that there is a way that does not look like our culture and our world. We've said this for the last few weeks. Mm-hmm. There's a way that doesn't look like our culture and the world. And when the church looks just like everybody else, we're missing the mark. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I really appreciate you bringing in uh, that Baldwin passage and putting it up against this. And I think it I think it's a highlight for the psalm as well. Mm -hmm. And then I and and maybe put all of that in conversation with the commentary online on Mm -hmm. the psalm. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe you don't preach on the psalm, but just the the way Yolanda uh, does, you know, the good way and the wicked way, yeah. and um, how to you know give give language to the kind of the kind of choice that we're that we're talking about here and what's at stake. So yeah. thanks for going to the psalm. That's really helpful. Yeah, and I think in some settings too, this is great for Labor Day, depending upon your congregation and yeah. just thinking about what makes yeah. for human flourishing and who's expendable in our economy and. Mm-hmm. where does dignity come from i mean there's again you know your congregation's best but mm-hmm. it's a good text for today mm-hmm. exactly exactly yeah and yeah. Uh, choosing, choosing between um oh, what it what it means for us um to to make um this choice between life and death um jeremiah is kind of a different take or i read it as a different take And it's basically this point where it's like, look, we're the clay in the potter's hand. The potter has the imagination of what the potter is creating. Are we willing to become what is imagined by the potter? And and in this sense, as we've been talking today, but also in the last few weeks, that what God has always intended has been righteousness, what it would be equality, what would be just, what would be um, uh, meeting the needs of the least. That's in the imagination of God. And the, God wants to create a vessel that will uh, embody or distribute that righteousness. Are we willing to be made into that vessel? That, that's where I would go with that. Yeah, because, you know, a clay, clay is just a blob. It's, you know, it's not like it can will itself into a pot or a bowl or a cup or whatever we've tried to do when we've taken Pottery 101, (laughs) you know, and it, um, you know, I remember when my kids would bring home things and like, look, mom, it's a, and I'm like, yes, it is. (laughs) I made a mean, I can make a mean ashtray back in the first and second grades. I'm really good at that. (laughs) And you're like, yeah, that that's I believe you. That's what it is. But but uh, but that that image or that metaphor of 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 the, that trust in what God has in mind, God's vision, that that's that's a, how is it that we can make that choice? How is it that we can make the choice for, you know, for the good way? Uh, is is because of that, that God holds us in God's hands, that God has a vision for uh, whether it's a, you know, a ashtray or a, a pot or a mug or a, you know, a vase or something like God has that vision. And so how is it? I mean, I think the Jeremiah text, even though it's, you know, the alternate first reading and we're in Jeremiah, but it it could help. It could help with some of the themes I think that we've been talking about so far. Three weeks ago, Matt had us remember that God has always been doing this. 
And that's how we trust the potter Mm -hmm. is that God hasn't changed God's mind uh, about this good world. Mm -hmm. That's a good caveat because otherwise it seems a little unpredictable, right? Right. Jeremiah is like, well, maybe the potter is going to change his mind, you know, and yeah. But this idea of how God can be um, dynamic but without also being consistent. arbitrary. Yes. Dynamic yeah. and yet consistent. Yeah. 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 Or tr- and tr- I'd maybe even say trustworthy is more mm-hmm. than consistent. But I get your yeah. I get your point. Yeah. Well, God, God stays true to God's character. Yeah. Which yes. is sometimes a little unpredictable. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it it it's predictable or dynamic, it's unpredictable or dynamic in how God responds to the circumstance where the justice and righteousness that God imagined is not being lived out. I'm trying to think of the text from uh two weeks ago, I think it was two, or was it last week, where um um, the uh, uh, what was produced from the vineyard, I think it was two weeks ago, what was produced from yeah. the vineyard was not what God um, um, ha- had imagined. And, and how is God going to respond to that? That's what we don't know. But what God imagined, we do know. It was justice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Philemon, which is... Yeah. Um, which is a, you know, a book it's easy to laugh at because it's so short and because there's so much confusion around it. But it's such an important book for people mm. to know something about. And it's kind of a shame it falls here in the lectionary where some just will skip over it because it's Labor Day weekend. And Israel Kamenzadu does a great job with it. Oh, it's such a good commentary. commentary. Yeah. So, commentary. Yeah. wow, if you don't preach on it today, make sure you save this and do a yeah. Bible study on it sometime. But let's mm-hmm. talk a bit about this because it's a great way to dip into not just a letter and not just Paul in the abstract, but to talk into the but to dip into the the real difficulty of living out the vision of justice you were talking about, Joy, where I, I think it's an ambiguous letter. I think Paul is a little ambivalent. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure Paul even knows exactly what he wants because what he wants might be so wild that he can't even imagine it. But what does Christian kinship look like? Mm-hmm. in light of the realities of ancient slavery, mm-hmm. where I think Paul recognizes things can't say the, stay the same, but he's not exactly sure how to make it different either. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So he's, mm-hmm. we might think differently about this, but I think one of, the, one of the beautiful things about the letter is it shows just how hard it is mm-hmm. to imagine a way forward sometimes when the norms look like they're uh, not contestable at all. Right. Exactly. Right. I, I appreciate. Think, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, oh, go ahead Joy. No, go ahead. I appreciate that, Matt, um, because I think sometimes we miss just how countercultural um, Paul's letter and expectation in this letter is, and um, we can be angry that he didn't just completely upset the norm in one act. Um, I'm looking at, you know, 60 years of civil rights. I'm looking at, you know, a couple of, a few centuries of of the United States uh, experiment. I'm looking at, you know, half a millennial of racial injustice. Our laws, our government, our practices, our culture, our way of life is not turning things to the good that God has asked. And so my expectation of what Paul has done or has not done here is not to uh, say, well, how come he didn't just disrupt things immediately? But as you said, Matt, to recognize he was asking for something that was so unheard of, he didn't even know how to put it into words. Mm -hmm. And yet it's the very seed that gives birth to dismantling uh, to dismantling slavery, um, and and another piece that's in the midst of this that can get overlooked that I just want to highlight is in the very introduction, um, he calls out a woman, and 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 so let's not dismiss that in Paul's greeting he specifically calls out to greet a woman. And and we need to recognize those little acts of Paul in the culture that he lived in was was a shout. 
and I think a seed rather than a failure. Well, he's reminding Philemon that this very personal letter isn't just between the two of them, that people are reading over his shoulder too, right? That he's going to be accountable to a wider community and wider relationships. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Caroline, you were going to say something. Oh, I, only that, uh, that I, I think uh, one of the, well, you said this at the beginning, Matt, when we were talking about this, I think it's remarkable that this teeny little 21 verse letter is in our scripture uh that it pat managed to pass the test and you know and get in the canon is really and like you said it's so it's unfortunate that it's lost on this sunday because of what all everything you were saying joy you know of, of the way in which it plants the seed for and that paul doesn't really quite know what to do with either uh, in terms of that this has to change as well. You know, everything has to change, you know, going back to, you know, Galatians, it's, it's new creation. And so, uh, and so what is that, you know, what is that going to mean? But uh, that the commentary uh, where uh, ministry is not based on tolerance, but on human dignity mm-hmm. and the way in which the way in which the commentary recognizes that uh, that reality of what the gospel does of raising up, <laughs> raising up the, the lowly and raising up uh, and calling us to task of, you know, who, how we, how, how we see others, yeah. uh, you know, how we see others and, uh, and, and, and that, how we see others that is so embedded in systems that we can't even name it. We can't even, you know, like critical race theory, that's not a thing. And we, we can't even talk about it because it's so, you know, so embedded in our, in our, in our lives and our privilege. Uh, and yet at the end of the day, um, it, it ha- that to what extent the gospel is this call to a, a create new creation that is about human dignity and human rec- and God's recognition of all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm.